Hampshire got up on stage and they gave him a microphone, which is always a mistake. Videotape this. Yeah. Uh oh, they Good. gave him a microphone. And then he did his rendition of the MLK speech, which was pretty much taking the speech, ripping its spine out, throwing it in the garbage, and sticking his own words onto the spine of it, filling in the flesh and bones and meat. And uh, he created a monster. I will be reading to you a rendition of the Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. Edited and updated personally by me to fit the uh, time allotted and the times and struggles of today's environment. I am happy to join with you today in celebrating an event that went down as one of the greatest demonstrations for freedom in the history of our nation. 148 years ago, a great American, in whose symbolic shadow we stand today, signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon of light to millions of black slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, African Americans were still not free. 100 years later, the life of these citizens were still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. 100 years later, they languished in the corners of American society and found themselves exiles in their own land. And today, there are even more Americans who have yet to taste the sweet nectar of freedom. So we've come here today to dramatize a shameful condition that still plagues our country, if only in a different form. In a sense, Dr. King came to our nation's capital that day in 1963 to cash a check. When the architects of our the Republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. They were signing a promissory note to which all Americans were to fall there. This note was a promise that all people, yes, black people, homosexual people, transgender people, as well as straight people and white people, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the front of its people a bad check. A check that has come back marked insufficient funds. But we refuse to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. And so we come today to cash this check. A check that will give us, upon demand, the riches of freedom and the security of justice. We have also come to this hallowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Now is the time to make real promises of democracy. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of ignorance to the sunlit path of tolerance. Now is the time to lift our nation from the quicksands of injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. This sweltering summer of the American people's legitimate discontent will not pass until there is an invigorating article of freedom and equality. 1963 was not an end, but a beginning. Those who hoped that the young of this nation needed to just blow off steam and will now be content will have a rude awakening if the nation returns to business as usual. There will be neither rest nor tranquility in America until its citizens are granted their citizenship rights. The whirlwinds of revolt will continue to shake the foundations of our nation until the bright day of justice emerges. But there's something that I must say to my people who stand in the warm threshold which leads into the palace of justice. In the process of gaining our rightful place, we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from a cup of bitterness and hatred. We must forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. We must not allow our creative protest to degenerate into physical violence. As we walk, we must make the pledge that we shall always march ahead. We cannot turn back. There are those who ask the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? And they answer, 
that they would never be satisfied as long as the Negro was the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. They could not be satisfied as long as the Negro's basic mobility was from a smaller ghetto to a larger one. They would not be satisfied as long as the Negro in Mississippi could not vote and a Negro in New York believed he had nothing for which to vote. And I say we cannot be satisfied now until equality can be found all over this earth, rich or poor, black or white, gay or straight. I say no, no, we are not satisfied and will not be satisfied until justice and righteousness roll down like a mighty stream. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair. I say to you today, my friends, so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live up to the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. I have a dream that I will never again see a child with scars on their wrists, crying out for the deliverance from the hate and cruelty of their peers. I have a dream that one day there will be no protesters raining down condemnations from hate-filled tongues onto the bodies of bludgeon boys and girls in the name of the good Lord. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted, and every hill and mountain shall be made low, the rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is the faith that I carry throughout my life. With this faith, we will be able to hew out to the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, and to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will all be free one day. This will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with new meaning, my country to the thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride. And from every mountainside, let freedom ring. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. And so, let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the stone mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi, from every mountainside. Let freedom ring. And when this happens, when we allow freedom to ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, atheists and Baptists, gays and straights, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, God Almighty, I am free at last. <laughs> I wouldn't laugh on my fingers. <laughs>